47 Ronin. Do you know him? 47 Samurai, whose master was betrayed and killed by another lord. They became Ronin, masterless Samurai, disgraced by another man's treachery. And for three years they plotted, pretending to be thieves, mercenaries, even madmen that I didn't have time to do. And then one night they struck, slipping into the castle of their lord's betrayer, killing him. Nice, like that, my kind of job. There's something more. All 47 of them committed sepulchral ritual suicide in the courtyard of the castle. Well, that I don't like so much. Chris Kelzer here with... Matt Howell. On this episode of The First Run, <laughs> I like the little pregnant pause there. I was wondering uh, if we're going to go with that. I was, I was doing very important research, and I was a little little late. I was not prepared for a, a long intro sequence. I bring this stuff on. So, just to clarify, you were doing some prep work, and giving you more time was the problem. Yeah, because I was, I was deep in my... It was deep in thoughts. I was doing for the good of the show. I don't want to spoil anything, but I, I was doing for the good of the show. Well, uh, if you haven't caught up by now, whenever we have an intro clip, it's because somebody of some significance passed away. And of course, Michael Lonsdale passed away this past week. That is a clip from Ronin. And of course, you may know him more as the big bad guy from Moonraker, as well as a bunch of other stuff. So that was our little tribute to Lonsdale. Coming up on the show this week, Matt and I are going to discuss the Netflix original, The Devil All the Time, featuring an all-star cast... And they interact and stuff happens. Uh, then our new noir marathon continues with Park Chan-wook's The Handmaiden, a story of love and betrayal in Japanese-occupied Korea. We'll share the big releases on physical media featuring your streaming and straight-to-DVD picks of the week. And of course, then we'll wrap up the show with another round of everybody's favorite Vegas-based odds-making game, What Are the Odds? Let's start everything up, though, with a clip from The Devil All the Time. Sure. Some of us are better off than others. And I see plenty of white meat and red meat laid out on this table. And I suspect that the folks that carried them platters in eat mighty good sometimes. But poor people got to bring what they can afford. So them organs. as a sign to me, telling me that I should, as the new preacher of this church, sacrifice myself so that y'all can have a share of the good meat tonight. And that's what I'm going to do, friends. I'm going to eat these organs. And I model myself on the good Lord Jesus whenever he gives me the chance. And today, he's blessed me with another opportunity to follow in his footsteps. So I think we should have an accent off with Pattinson and LeBlanc. Maybe do a right. team-up film. Mm-hmm. There you I'm go. Sure, getting your nailing your southern accents, which I'm sure is something you rather enjoyed from this film. Oh yeah, you had a bunch of uh, British actors uh, thrown in. All I had to do was bring in Daniel Craig, and it would have just it would have had everybody that I love their southern accents for. So Matt, why don't you tell everybody what is the devil all the time all about? I like how you give me the tough ones to summarize. Um, it's the story of intertwining uh, relationships and people that live in a particular area of uh, West Virginia and Ohio and how their lives kind of intersect tragically throughout on these kind of highways to ruin that they've set for themselves. That's pretty good. I may have even liked that more than the film itself. I'm not sure. <laughs> so I just want to start off with, as always, my, my plea Stop killing dogs. I'm begging you. Stop killing dogs in these films. I don't know why we have to keep doing this. But again, we are here. I'm fine with everybody who dies in the film, regardless of I know. Which, that's, but... that's more disturbing, Chris. That's more disturbing. You become a misanthrope. You're more concerned about our four-legged friends than you are about your fellow man. Come well, on. Because we have a species, I think. We're ready to call it a day. I think, mm-hmm. uh, I think we're good. I think we've hit our creative output top. You know, we've hit that. And now uh, the zeitgeist, if you will. And I think it's time, maybe. I don't know if I'm rooting for a meteor 
some kind of climactic devastate. I don't know, but I'm getting very nihilistic about things. So let's talk about the devil all the time. Matt, oh, let's. <laughs> there is a lot going on here. Yeah. So how do you think that uh, writer, director Antonio Campos did? Did he pull off what he was doing and what was he trying to do? I'm not exactly sure what he was trying to do. Um, I think we've we've seen these type of stories before where you're trying to set up these kind of seemingly different narratives that seem to have no relation to each other. And then they kind of all kind of coalesce and collide. And in this one, they don't really so much come together as so much as they kind of cross paths with each other at different points this um what's that gosling movie behind the the pines uh what what is that called what was oh, that yeah. gosling movie? something like that uh, like the truth behind the pines or there's something yeah, yeah i know what you're talking about yeah that's what this reminded me of the place you know, behind the pine the pines a place, place behind the pines beyond the pines we'll get there folks yeah so that's what this kind of reminded me of. It's kind of this uh, look at like, you know, rural America in the 50s and 60s. This kind of, especially back then and to an extent now, it's still a very insular place, still a very kind of um, secluded and isolated place and how these people kind of prey upon each other, interact with each other. And there's kind of like this death of hope thing going on. I don't know if necessarily there's enough in these different threads to kind of hold this thing together. I think there are points in this that are individually, I think, are powerful or at least are good taken. But when they kind of put them together as a whole, they don't really work for me broadly. I'm inclined to agree with you. I think that this is a really good Netflix movie. Mm. Uh, But that's as far as the praise I would go for it. There is a lot going on here. And as you said, I don't think Campos ever really pulls the threads together well. I don't know if this is an editing issue, which I think is funny because... There's this whole thing about editing on film Twitter like a week ago or so this past week. I don't know if you saw all that or people not understanding what the point of editing really is. It's not just chopping mm-hmm. for time. Right. But there is a, this loose connection amongst all these characters as they eventually kind of interact with each other. The whole thing just felt too slack to me and not cohesive at all. It's a vast cast that I think performs well, but everything relies, I think, too heavily on coincidence. I think what... Campos is trying to do here, Matt, is tell this grand message about religion and class, family, destiny, and really the violence inherent in our society. And I just don't think that truth ever comes across well enough. Or at least nothing comes together as well as I think he's hoping that it does. Listen, the set design is great. I think the world feels authentic and lived in, right? It does feel very much of the, of its time. But the grand scope of everything he's trying to present to us, I think, eludes his grasp in the end. I think, as you said, some of the offshoots and our different character arcs are interesting, but it never feels, as we said, it never comes together as a cohesive whole. And things kind of just feel not quite slapped together, but we got this, we got character A, B, C, D. All right, I got to make sure P meets, B meets with E at some point so then we can further along C's character. And it just didn't really come together for me at all. Yeah, I agree. I don't know what else more to say. I mean, obviously, you know, kind of getting into too much of the details of this would do it a disservice to anyone who may be interested in watching this film. Um, I think, you know, there are other examples of this. You know, I'm not much of a skill, film scholar to kind of point out all the different examples of this. And I think to varying degrees, the kind of faces that you'll recognize in this are successful to different levels. I wasn't particularly impressed with Pattinson myself. Mm-hmm. I liked Holland well enough. Yeah. Skarsgård was fine. You know, Sebastian Stan, I wasn't really super impressed with either. So I, I think for the most part, it's okay. I wouldn't, I mean, but I mean, honestly, what are your alternatives? We're all stuck inside. There's no movies at the movie theater. So, I mean, if you want to catch something that has its moments and has some challenges to it, uh, put the kids to bed and, and check it out. Yeah, I think that's fair. I think that's a good way to really wrap it up. I, I, I don't have much else to say about it either. I mean, there's only so much as you said you can say without spoiling it for somebody who doesn't want to watch it. And said, there's enough here to watch it for your streaming pleasure, right? You know, due to your quarantine and confinement, then uh, fine. I ended up giving the devil all the time Matt a C. Yeah, uh, I think I liked it a little bit more than you. I got to be a C plus. Yeah, I thought there were certain points of it that elevated it. I think a little bit higher than a C. Fair enough. If you had a chance to see the devil all the time, we'd love to hear your thoughts. Shoot us an email at feedback 
at thefirstrun.com. Matt, coming up on your physical media this upcoming Tuesday, September 29th. There's only one new release and then some catalog stuff. One is a film I'm curious about that I just don't... It never really connected with me in the day. It was a big letdown because I absolutely loved this director's first film. I'm kind of curious what your thoughts are, but you can now get a collector's edition of this movie from Era. Tell me, Brody, uh, why did you and your girlfriend break up? She was a pain in the ass. She wanted me to be this typical boyfriend guy. Said I was too into my own world, comics and all. Yeah, I can relate. There was a time when it was all about comics for me. You know, I, I had a girl probably the same as yours. She always complained that I spent too much time with my own comics. And, uh... Eventually, we broke up. See, what did she know? Here you are now, a legend in the field. Probably had a slew of women since her, am I right? Oh, lots of women. Jagger and me, we had a running contest to see who had the most. Matter of fact, last time I looked, I was way ahead. Damn, that's hot! (laughs) That, of course, is a clip from Mallrats. Arrow is releasing a limited edition version, which includes a brand new restoration by Arrow of both the theatrical and extended cuts of the film. Approved by Kevin Smith, the director. A newly assembled TV cut featuring hilarious overdubbing to cover up the profanity. I gotta admit, I think that's something I want to check out. There's a fold-out poster of some of the blueprints from Operation Drive-By and Operation Dark Knight. And more. A bunch of new interviews and some other stuff. Matt, what are your opinions on Mallrats? I remember when it first came out, I was not particularly impressed with it. I The kind of jarring transition from what Clerks was to what Mallrats was, I didn't really like it. As I've aged and it's aged, I have warmed on it some, but it's it's very much a relic of its time. And I think you got to be in that headspace when you watch it. Just realize this is a very 90s, early 90s film, and they really lean hard into that stuff. Yeah, no, that's true. It's also coming out is The Silencing. Now, Matt, how do you pronounce the guy from... Uh the game of thrones the brother guy who was well the guy who was sleeping with his sister uh, oh yeah uh nikolai coster wald waldar waldar yeah Waldau? I think that's probably, yeah Waldau. well yeah. he stars in this film about a reformed hunter living in isolation <laughs> on a wildlife sanctuary becomes involved in a deadly game of cat and mouse when he and the local sheriff set out to track a vicious killer who may have kidnapped his daughter years ago also getting released is season one of star girl the latest in the DC Universe shows. I hear this is actually really good and uh, introduces the uh, Justice Society to not quite the Arrowverse. I don't believe Stargirl is connected to the Arrowverse, technically. It was a, I think it was simulcast on CW and DC Universe. Mm. So, um, yeah, you can pick up Stargirl. Also coming up, Criterion is giving us The Elephant Man, David Lynch's film. It includes a a brand new 4K restoration, archival interviews, audio recording from 1981 of an interview and Q&A with Lynch at the American Film Institute. The Terrible Elephant Man revealed a 2001 documentary about the film and more. They're also releasing the latest in Martin Scorsese's World Cinema Project. This is number three. Lucia from 1968 from Cuba. Indonesia's After the Curfew from 1954. Brazil's Peyote from 1981. Mexico's Dos Monias from 1934, Mauritania's Soleo, and then Iran's Downpour from 72, and I should say Soleo was from 1970. Scream Factory is giving us Ghost Ship. I remember not liking this movie, but I did love that opening as to why the boat is haunted. Mm. That is uh, That was part of quite a good effect. There are four brand new uh, featurettes, three of them interviews, and then the other is an audio commentary with the director, Steve Beck. Alphabet City is being released, a brand new 2K restoration from the 35mm inner positive. It's a film about a New York City drug dealer who decides to get out of the business, but has to flee from mobsters. It includes a newly recorded audio commentary by the director Amos Poe, a new film interview with actor Vincent Spano, and more. Kino Lorber is giving us Gotcha, starring Anthony Edwards and Linda Fiorentino. Jonathan Moore is a shy UCLA vet student and the reigning champion at Gotcha a campus-wide paintball game. While on vacation in West Germany, did you tell you how old the film is, Matt? He's seduced by an older woman, the sexy and mysterious Sasha, who turns out to be an international spy. Yul Brenner features in Death Rage. He plays a retired hitman who decides to take one last job to the avenge the murder of his brother by the mafia gang who killed him. 
Severin is releasing a bunch of stuff, including Cruel Jaws, also known as Jaws 5 internationally, a brand new remaster of the fully uncut version of the film. Includes something called the Snyder Cut, which is the unreleased Japanese extended cut of the movie. If you're not familiar with kind of the international films, Matt, they'll kind of ape off of classic films and do like fake sequels, right? Like Fulci's Zombie 2 was like a, a sequel to Night of the Living Dead, known as Jaws 5 in some parts of the world. There's a bunch that kind of did stuff like that. Severin is also releasing Massacre in Dinosaur Valley. A plane crashes in the Amazon jungle and its passengers must battle their way through cannibals, slave traders, wild animals, and murderous piranha fish with a vendetta. I added that part. The fish don't have a vendetta. A brand new 4K restoration of the fully uncut version from the original camera negative. Interviews with the actor and co-writer, deleted and extended scenes, and more. They're also giving us primitives, also known as savage terror. After a raft accident in the jungle, three anthropology students and their guides attempt to escape from a primitive cannibal, cannibal, some say cannibal, other places say cannibal. Either way, they're abominable. <laughs> ah, that's hunting them down. New remaster of that film, new interviews, and more. Cult classic, Sometimes Aunt Martha Does Dreadful Things is being released by AGFA. Brand new 2K restoration of that from the 35mm theatrical print. Stanley and Paul met a pair of friends on the run from the law, rent a house in the suburbs where they decide the best way to lay low is for Paul to dress as a woman and pretend to be Stanley's Aunt Martha. Not too long after their pair move into their home, though, Paul suddenly murders a young woman Stanley brings home with him. Paul's violent tendencies continue to spin out of control, and soon nobody who comes near is safe from Aunt Martha. Warner Archive is giving us Jeremiah Johnson. Bloom House of Horrors is a box set that includes... Well, it's not really a box set per se, but it's just a bunch of Bloom House films in one package. The Purge, Ouija, The Boy Next Door, Unfriended, The Visit, Split, Get Out, Happy Death Day, Truth or Dare, and Ma, all included in this set. There's some brand new 4K steelbooks coming from Best Buy, the original Halloween, Evil Dead 1 and 2 in a combo pack, in Fury Road. I gotta admit, Matt, I went back and forth on upgrading my Evil Deads to 4K. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. How much better can they look? Won't they just look really fake then? Right. But, I don't know. I may still go. And then Fury Road too. I don't know if I should... If any film just screams to be upgraded to 4K, I think one of them would be Max... Would be Mad Max Fury Road. So your straight-to-DVD pick of the week is Welcome to Sudden Death. First run favorite Michael J. White stars as Jesse Freeman. He's a former Special Forces officer and explosive expert, now working as a regular job as a security guard in a state of the art basketball arena. Trouble erupts when a tech savvy cadre of terrorists kidnap the team's owner and Jesse's daughter during opening night. Facing a ticking clock and impossible odds, it's up to Jesse to not only save them, but also a full house of fans in this highly charged action thriller. What should we be streaming this week? So I'm going to recommend a film that just came out on Amazon Prime, recently released. This is one of those films from the early 90s that was kind of uh, one of the... If you knew a film New York friend in the early 90s, they had this on DVD and they would push it on people. Delicatessen. It's a French film about a dystopian post-apocalyptic future where food is very scarce and much like Soylent Green, a particular deli owner decides that he's going to, um, you know, get some cheap meat by luring in people of perspective for work. It's kind of like a dark uh, French comedy, a weird little film, but it's worth checking out if you're kind of want to get into the what the indie movie scene looked like back in 1991. I have never seen it. I remember clearly the poster or the mm-hmm. video VHS cover, whatever it is to this day. But yeah. I never actually saw it. And where is it streaming again? Amazon Prime. Amazon Prime? Mm, Yeah. Check that out. Good times. All right, Matt. Let's keep rolling and spend a few minutes talking about the latest film in our neo-noir marathon, Park Chan-wook's The Handmaiden. (laughs) 중독배도 연줄이 있어서 전기까지 끌어다 쓰는데 이런 데게 왔으니 네가 얼마나 싹싹한 하녀가 되어야겠니? 
가끔 전기 나갈 때 놀라지 말고. So Matt, a con man has enlisted the help of a pickpocket to assist him in conning a wealthy heiress in order to convince her to marry him so then he can abscond with her fortune with the pickpocket, right? The plan is at some point she's going to have her declared insane and then he'll pay off the pickpocket and then he'll be able to jettison off with all the funds. And that's all I'm going to say. So... This is based on a 2002 novel called Fingersmith. Originally, I think, in Victorian England is where it's based. Right. But Chan Wook's version is now in Jap- Japanese-occupied Korea. And let me tell you, Matt, this thing, it's twisty, turny, sexy as all hell. And it's a thriller, and this thing totally delivered. I was... This thing is, what, two hours and 20 minutes long? 2.25? Mm-hmm. And there's like a two, there's like a one that's almost three hours long, like to 245. The director's cut or extended cut that I am now desperate to see because I loved this thing. What are your thoughts? Yeah, I, I was sucked in by this film. Um, it's absolutely gorgeous, um, as a lot of uh, uh, Chen Wook's films are. And yeah, they are immaculately yeah, shot, every one of his are. films. It's, it's, it's such as the same with this one. It's like a classic film noir put into pre-war colonial Korea. And it's got these, a lot of the kind of hallmarks. And I got like this kind of, I hope I'm not spoiling anything a little bit, but I got a bit of a, a bound vibe from this um, mm, the, yeah. with the Wachowskis, uh, one of their earliest films. And I was really on board for this. The kind of constant twists and turns, like where one shoe drops and then like, no, it's a reversal. And then a reversal of the reversal and more and reversals on top of everything. You know, I just thought it was fantastic. And that's what kind of one of the things you watch film noir for. And even though this is not your typical setting for a film noir, I appreciate they kind of took some of those trappings and kind of placed them into something outside of what we're used to. Yeah, I mean, this is like the blooming onions of films, right? Every time you pull you pull a, re, uh, a layer back, you get a new yeah. reveal. Something else then comes, and I didn't expect any of the stuff that happened. That's one of the great joys of this film is you want to go in as cold as possible because every time you take a turn, every time there's three parts in this film, and every time we transition, the film kind of turns on its head, and it's fantastic. As Matt said, it is gorgeously shot. Not just with its imagery, but also there's a pitch-perfect use of sound, including music and effects, I think. I love the clash of the different architecture styles at one point, like the house that they're currently in. And just setting this in Japanese-occupied Korea sets off so many underlying plot lines about free will and subjugation and passion and all these things. It just sets the stage perfectly. I mean, I think this film's got it all. And I was really blown away, too, Matt, at sometimes how funny it was. There are a few key scenes that I just was like, I actually stopped. I was like, wow, that I would laugh out loud or there would be a scene where that is perfect. That is awesome. I mean, it, it is so many kind of showstopper moments in this thing. And you really, I think, connect with these characters much more so than I think you did with the previous film we discussed. I mean, this film is, it's, it's funny because it's a powerhouse of filmmaking. And yet it's so delicate and refined at the same time. It is really quite the adventure. And for me, it's the best film we've seen in this marathon so far. If you're familiar with Park Chan-wook's work, he, I first got, came to him, Matt, with Old Boy, which absolutely floored me. And then I watched the rest of the Vengeance trilogy. And then, of course, his first English film, English language film, was Stoker, which, if you haven't seen, is fantastic. You really, it kind of flew under the radar and it not, didn't get a lot of attention here, but it is very, very good. So if you can catch up with that, you certainly should. But Matt, The Handmaiden is absolutely wonderful. I ended up giving it an A. What about you? I gave it an A minus. I think, you know, there are pieces of it that, you know, I don't know if this is a, an effect of the source material. Sometimes there comes a point where you do so many twists and reversals that they start stop having the impact they necessarily did as you kind of go through. So I think if there's one minor quibble, that would, for me, that would be it. But I really enjoyed this. Um, I'm really enjoying this marathon so far. Mm. I've, I think I've given each one of these films like a B plus or an A minus. So yeah, I'm on board. Yeah. Hopefully we can close out strong. And I, and I can't believe that this is uh, one half of his, of his last films. He hasn't made another one since, since this. Yeah, no, it's been what, four years now, right? Yes, yeah, it has. It's horrible. Let's get on it, buddy. Let's go. 
<laughs> so uh, what else I want to say? Oh, just a heads up on some things, folks. This is also at times pretty explicit in its uh, portrayal of sexuality between some of the characters. So just as a heads mm-hmm. up. It's not. I, I wouldn't recommend this as an all family viewing experience. No. So just so you know, but I think it's. We don't do a lot of kind of erotic thrillers on this show at all. Now that I think about it, uh, but it is there too. He handles all of those scenes very well too. I mean, it's. I thought 2016 was a pretty good year for films, and I did not see this in the year, and I've been meaning to catch up with it ever since. And I am so happy we did. I wonder if this would have been in like my top 10 or top five. It's, I liked it that much. I and mean, this is the La La Land Moonlight year, folks. All right. Don't forget. Mm-hmm. So, mm-hmm. wow. Great stuff. And it's currently available on Amazon Prime right now. Uh, I, I can't seem to find the extended cut streaming anywhere. I'll have to see. Right. So, uh, let's see if I can track that down somehow and check that out. If you've already seen it, though, shoot us an email at feedback at the first run.com. As always, we'd love to hear your thoughts, Matt. All right. Any, I should say, any uh, last minute words on Handmaid? It's, it's a rough week because I don't want to spoil too much in either of these films, particularly Handmaiden, right? I mean, all I can really tell you is it's exquisitely acted. It's a beautifully shot film, but I don't want to get into any of the details of this thing because for me, every point of it was so engrossing. Every frame of it was beautiful. And then every turn, every action every line delivery everything was just so good but i don't want to spoil it for anybody yeah well i think uh to our listeners i think that would um imply you know how chris feels about this film because he had absolutely no qualms about spoiling cape fear or the grifters and the (laughs) stuff that happens in that um so that should show where this rates um you know so yeah i i would just go into it go into it as cold as possible i think you're you're correct if it will spoil your enjoyment of it if you kind of know what's coming um you know and yeah just don't watch it with your don't watch it with your mom don't watch it with your kids um and you should be fine that's another thing too about the sound design with those (laughs) i I don't know if i had headphones on while i was watching it but it was yeah yeah, just a heads up folks all right (laughs) let's spend a few minutes then matt and let's go over the latest round of what are the odds the past isn't dead James, fate draws us back together. Now your enemy is my enemy. His name is Seven. And what does he want? Revenge. Me. When her secret finds its way out, it'll be the death of you. You can imagine why I've come back to play. So that, of course, is an excerpt from the latest trailer for No Time to Die, the latest James Bond film. Mm -hmm. Um, I'm still convinced that they're going to kill him at the end, and then they'll just pass on his name as a code name going forward, which I will absolutely loathe. But (laughs) we'll see what happens. Matt, what are the odds No Time to Die gets delayed until 2021? I would say 90%. Um, I think uh, I was going to ask a similar question, but I, I, it's tough because, you know, as a film podcast and we kind of try and stay up to date on things, a lot of this, we ask a lot of the same questions on some of these things because 2020 has been such a strange year. I think honestly, folks, I'm calling it now. um, I think it's a foregone conclusion that black widow and no time to die. Dune wonder woman, basically every major studio release that's scheduled for the end of the year gets pushed out to 2021. There's no way that somebody's going to have another tenant on their hands as far as from a a dollar perspective. It's just not going to happen. Yeah, I think we are vaccine bound at this point. I don't think AMC and a lot of these chains are going to make it now. I agree with you. I actually wrote down 90% exactly as well for no time to die is being delayed. It's a very sad, sad time. And we'll see how things play out. I hope that's not the case, but I think it's inevitable at this point. And that's the other thing, too, about the vaccine, folks. Don't get super excited. All right. It's not going to be, you're not going to be able to go in your CVS and get it. That's not how it's going to roll out. So um, never mind the fact that people are going to, well, that's another whole conversation. So 90% for me for No Time to Die as well. Matt, what do you got? 
I'll be really interested before we get into that. I mean, I'll just be really interested because Fauci's saying we're not getting back to normal until like the end of next year. So yeah. like even even if this stuff is even if it comes out to when they pushed it out, you know, or if we get a really solid June to December, you know, for twenty twenty one. All right. So I was doing some I was looking around on the on the interwebs and somebody had suggested some storyline of Wonder Woman's um, that I'm not familiar with, but I guess it has something to do with the fact that it's very brutal and very violent and something that's very not normally a Wonder Woman story. So it got me thinking, what are the odds we actually we get an R-rated DC film in the near future? Oh, well, I think well, I think they're pretty good. I'd imagine that we'd be at, if the industry exists, I would say we'd get an R-rated DC film within, I'd say, well, isn't the Suicide Squad going to be R or no? Oh, yeah. I guess I completely forgot about that. All right. Well, then I guess I ruined my own question. So 100%. <laughs> I mean, yeah, they'll lean into something. Like maybe right. they'll redo Constantine. Maybe they'll yeah. do something. But they'll, uh, yeah, for sure. I think the um, the tougher question would be Marvel. Where they odds you get a Marvel film that's rated R that's yeah. in the MCU. Yeah. You know? Well, that's, that's a good point. I mean, I guess I would say... Disney has I mean, a much stricter hold on that stuff. They are, they are. But I don't know if they create, like, you know, we had talked about, like, you know, having Fox Searchlight or whatever they're calling it, like Searchlight Now um, or 20th Century Film be the, the resting place for some of that stuff. Because, I mean, Deadpool made too much money and Logan um, is too well received, I think, for them to completely abandon it. I think those things are pretty, it was pretty critical. Those would be very, very different movies if they were not as violent and, and filthy in Deadpool's case as they were. I'm looking online to see what uh, if I can find anything about the Suicide Squad just to confirm that it's rated R and obviously it hasn't been rated yet but everything I'm reading is that it's a hard R <laughs> that they just let Gunn do whatever he wanted. Well, they've got like 75 like cast members in that so you got to figure like 70 of them are going to die bloodily. So Kinnaman, who plays Flag, just five days ago, told Collider that Suicide Squad will be a heavily R-rated film. There you go. So lots of violence, folks. Lots of profanity. Maybe there'll be some penetration. You never know. Okay. <laughs> I'm going to keep the Bond thing going. There was an announcement by one of the media outlets in the UK that the next James Bond has been cast. And it is my fan favorite, my choice, Tom Hardy. What are the odds Tom Hardy is the next James Bond? You son of a bitch. That is my second question. <laughs> um, so I will say, I'll say 80%. I don't feel like Tom Hardy it would shy away from being in a, um, you know, cashing them checks, uh, getting some, uh, being in a long running series. I think he was willing to do that when he got into Mad Max. So I think he could certainly bring into it. Now, how, how many he'll be on board for, that'll be remain to be seen. I could see him only wanted to do a few, but I think it's pretty, I think it's pretty solid. 80%. We get uh, Hardy as James Bond. Yeah, no, it's 20% actually. Oh, it's 20%. Yeah. So then who do, you, who do you have as, as uh, the, the guy? I think the issue with Hardy is he's too old. He's 43. Okay. And I think they want to go with a guy in his late 20s, maybe early 30s, and they can lock okay. in for a good five, six picture deal, maybe. And mm -hmm. also, I think Hardy's too big at this point. I think that he's too well known an actor. I think they like to get somebody who's coming up, maybe not quite blown up yet. Mm -hmm. And I think that man may be Dan Stevens. So, you think so? I possibly. I'm leaning towards Steven. Now, I've wanted Hardy for a very long time because right. I think he's able to deliver the brutality and then just the, the sinisterness that I think the, the best Bonds have had, Connery, Craig, right? I think they were able to give that off. But um, and I think Steven's maybe more in the more category. But um, right. I don't know. We'll see. I, I would love Hardy, but I can't. Maybe if they do like a 2-3 film run, but I just don't think that's what they want to do. And again, you never, you don't know. With everything up in the air as to who Bond is going to be, meaning is he going to be James Bond, but just a code name now, I, I don't know. I really hope I'm wrong about that. I really do. But we'll see what happens. <laughs> Opens the door, though. Yeah, I mean, it, it's fascinating. Now, listen, you could have a James Bond, uh, an ethnic minority playing James Bond today. Yeah, you could. It's, you, it's the opening up to uh, a gender swap that is a little more difficult, I think, unless you do the code name thing. Right. And um, we'll see. I got it. 
Yeah, I still I am fine with a multiracial or an ethnic or a, an a, a, an ethnic minority, a certain minority James Bond. I have no problem with that. I think the old you know, middle aged white guy with me still has an issue with a female James Bond. Right. Uh, just because who the character has always been. Mm-hmm. But I could probably be talked into it if it was the right you know actor. So I don't know. Well, you know, I'm I'm still waiting for them to cast somebody who's not British. I mean, like, you know, give me an American or a Canadian or Australian. Do it, you cowards. I mean, if Spider-Man and Superman are going to be played by Brits, no way. Yeah. Let's get some, let's get some, somebody else in there. Right. Just to piss, piss them off. God damn fair. it. Yeah. All right. Well, since you ruined my second question, now I only have one more. Okay. You ready? <laughs> yeah. All right. So the trailer for WandaVision dropped um, for, mm-hmm the uh, show on uh, Disney plus for the MCU. This is really one of their first MCU shows that are coming out straight to Disney plus. So it had 50 million views. What are the odds that the popularity, if this does really well, that they push up their time frame for some of the, all the MCU, MCU shows in the works. Now we've supposed to get Falcon and winter soldier and Loki next year, but we've also got what if Hawkeye Ms. Marvel moon Knight, and she Hulk in some level of production over the next like two or three years. I think uh, the odds of stuff gets pushed up is basically zero. I mean, I don't think it's a net, it's a, it's a, it's a, it's a better than zero, but maybe 5%. I think you're dealing just with, with Rona. You got the virus issues you're dealing with. You have other people's, you have contracts, obligations. I just don't see it happening. Uh, maybe what if, but then that one, cause that one, that's an animated series, right? That's not mm-hmm. actually going to be a live action thing, but no, I don't think so. I don't anticipate any movement. Disney does things on their own time. I don't think they really tend to react so much to market forces. They basically just say, we know what people like and here it is. And I don't see them rushing. To, I don't see like a Cars 2 or 3 scenario out of this now. No, I don't know. I mean, if, if I think it's much more likely. I'm going to say... I'm going to say 50... 50- one percent no actually i'm gonna say 49 percent. i think you're right in that it's not necessarily gonna happen but i like i think the odds are much much better just for the sense of the content on disney plus you know has been lacking and i don't know how long they're going to be able to maintain subscribers and right now that's only I mean, what else do they have as far as platforms go if this continues on from uh, a Corona standpoint um, for much longer, that's kind of like their distribution channel. And that's all they have. So if they're releasing the Mandalorian once, and then if that's all they got to bring in the masses, I think they're going to, there's going to be a push to bring in more people. I mean, they're even talking about putting soul um, the next Pixar film, like just straight on Disney plus. Yeah. Why not? I don't, yeah, it's just bring back song of the South, put it on there. I you think that, that's going to bring people back? Yeah. So <laughs> I don't think... Well, that's one thing that blew my mind about Disney Plus is remember when we were all talking about it, it was going to be this behemoth that was just going to crush Netflix and all the other streaming right. services. And I don't... It hasn't, right? It really right. It hasn't. So... Yeah, I think that's because they're very stingy with their content. And obviously, you know, they've just purchased... You know, the Fox merger went through, but they haven't really put a lot of that stuff out there yet. So... And they've got Hulu as well. So I feel like Disney Plus is more of their curated content kind of thing, whereas Hulu's like everything else. That's true. That's a good point. All right, man. Well, I gotta, I'll got i come up with another one on the fly just to extend the segment a little bit too. So okay. I'm not sure I've been following the Gina Carano action online the last few weeks. Yeah, I mean, I saw it. I mean, yeah, I saw it. All right. So what are the odds that she's going to be in season three of The Mandalorian? I think 60%. I think if she survives from a character standpoint in this next season, which I don't know if she did, I think it's pretty likely that she'll poop, that she'll continue. I think, you know, for better or worse, I think Twitter, much like Reddit, I think they overestimate the kind of kind of uh, the voice that they have necessarily, mm-hmm. and I do think there's some well deserved, you know, criticism there. But if it's gonna like, if they think, if you think it's gonna derail her career such as it is i think that's pretty unlikely i don't think uh yeah i don't think a company like disney is gonna let that kind of uh <laughs> gonna let that uh, slide if they think that she's doing a good enough job i don't know i mean they're pretty hypersensitive about upsetting the public i mean mm-hmm. they'll well, they come are. at you real fast 
there's a reason why James Gunn got canned initially, right? Yeah. So, but for but again, that's partly because of the zeitgeist of what's going on, and you know, obviously, this doesn't seem to have as much traction. No, honestly. it doesn't. It just it. Uh, I knew she was conservative, but I didn't know she was an a hole about it. You know, which is right. disappointing. <laughs> but and my only pushback on that would be that Pedro Pascal who's the, mm-hmm. the star of that show is a little more, he's much more open about that stuff. And it challenged her. I don't know if you saw him kind of, they had a talk, she said, sure. And he, and I think he has more weight on that show than she does. So I don't know if he would want her gone and if they would follow, follow his lead to do that. I don't know. It just, it just sucks when you find people that you like and you find little things about them that are just mm-hmm. not cool. You know, yeah. there's no need to be transphobic at this point <clears throat> anymore. It really isn't. Yeah, no, and you're right. There's not, you know, it's weird to say. I feel like I'm defending Gina, Gina Carano, which I'm not. It's just, you know, it's there are things that maybe Pedro Pascal's talking, and maybe she can find a way to be more humane um, and be more understanding. Maybe that's just something that she needs. I don't really know, but I just don't think the thing thing had enough of a. I mean, no mainstream source of media that I've seen has said anything about it. It's really just been like a hashtag and some geeks talking on Twitter for the most part. I don't I don't think it's really going to have much impact. That's true. And and I'm all on board for her kind of coming forward and say, you know what? I talked to Pedro, which she did, right? She understands mm-hmm. now what it's about and everything. But then she yeah. did the bleep blorp, you know, pronoun yeah. thing in her profile, sure. which was what was the problem. Right. So I, I have no problem with people redeeming or apologizing and kind of getting their ass together and realizing stuff. You know, I, I'm all mm-hmm. on board with that. I so we'll see. I'm just curious how it'll shake out. I am looking yeah. forward though to the second season of The Mandalorian. Yeah, Third, me too. first one was good, and um, we'll see how it goes. Oh, by the way, I finished season two of Hannibal. Yeah, and um, that last step, that finale is one of the most incredible season finales I've ever seen of a show. I mean, it is. Is it coming around for you? Almost poetic, and it's kind of tragedy of it all. Though I'm about three episodes, I'm in the middle of the third episode of season three, and so far I'm a little underwhelmed again. So we'll see. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> all right, my uh, my last one then for you, Matt. What are the odds Tenet makes more money at home than it does theatrically? Just to give you a little background. Okay. Tenet has made globally twenty five two excuse me two hundred fifty one point one million dollars. Okay. Historically, I'll give you that. The Dark Knight made just under a billion dollars in the theater. Right. At home, it made uh, almost three hundred and one million. Okay. And I think the Dark Knight was one of the largest selling kind of Blu-rays ever. Right. So, what do you think that uh, Tenet will make more money at home over theatrically? Uh, I think it's probably a twenty-five percent chance. I mean, I think uh, especially with people moving away from uh, digital, or I mean, sorry, physical media, which much I'm including the, digital st- purchases. Yeah, I purchases. yeah, but digitally, but generally, people, I think you know, are less. I think there's a, a larger portion of the people who are going to wait to see if it comes down digitally, or if it even comes on a streaming service, which it will at some point. I mean, obviously. Tenant's not Batman. Let's just face it. I mean, that's there's no greater pull, you know, from a social standpoint or from a, you know, kind of a iconic character standpoint. I don't think that there's going to be a huge rush to go out and see this thing, especially with the fact that the mixed reviews that it's gotten and people saying that, you know, it's not great. Yeah. No, I think, will it make more theatric? I mean, at home, where did I ask you? At home than theatrically. Uh, pa, pa, pa. We'll throw in rentals and purchases. Um, we'll clear. So, say, what do you think the ending global box office for Tenant will be? So, it's going to be out for a while. It's at two fifty one. Maybe it hits three. Right. I think that's that's generous. But yeah, okay, we'll say three. Will it make more than that at home? I'll go fifty fifty. No, I'm just kidding. Uh, I'll, <laughs> say, I'll go. I'm going to get close. I'll go 48% that it makes it more money at home. Like you said, I think it doesn't have the draw of The Dark Knight and some of the films. And it doesn't, it hasn't returned, you know, the reviews haven't been as positive for it as it has, his other, has as it has been on his other films. Right. So we'll see. But yeah, I'm not as confident on that one. And I think, I don't think I gave a percentage that Gina Carano will be on season three of The Mandalorian. So just to keep the game pure. I mm. say if her character survives, like you said, which is a great point, 
um, I'd say it's about a 63% chance she's back. Sure. Okay. There you go. She's come a long way, too. I mean, from her performances and stuff. Uh, yeah. She was good in Haywire and mm-hmm. then uh, Deadpool. She's a lot of fun. Is she the first or second one? The second one? And uh, yeah, I don't remember. I think first one. First one, you're right. Yeah. So, yeah. All right. Good times. What are the odds, folks? Shoot us an email at feedback at the first run dot com. You tell us what you think the odds of some of this craziness happening. Our calendar continues to be in flux. We are likely going to do Top Cow, maybe, with a film called Phoenix that I have never heard of, Matt. I have okay. never heard of it. Hopefully it's good. My so, suggestion. Yeah, you programmed this whole thing, and so far so good. So congratulations. Thanks. Bring it back. You know, we've had some we've had some tough uh, streaming uh, marathons this year so far. I'm although I'm looking forward to our next one too as well. Band films um, should really uh, yeah look for some uh, some uh, people eating poop. <laughs> Great. Check us out at Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, YouTube. Do a search for the first run. Scroll, scroll, scroll. Eventually, you will find us. Head on over to thefirstrun.com. Say hi. You can also go to Apple Podcasts. Give us a review. We will read it on air to help other people find the show. And uh, that's it, Matt. So uh, short show this week. Nice and yeah, it'll be good though. So uh, I'm gonna take an extended break, everybody, and uh, we will see you soon. Take care of yourselves. Once in my fridge cellar. Someone with a fresh soul!